I love Paris and the first Vendemir, just as the directory, the ministers, and all the constituted authorities were going to the Champ de Mars to celebrate the new year. According to the custom of the time, the president of the government walked up to the altar of the country and made a speech in which, among great praise bestowed on the armies, were frequently introduced threatening insinuations against the enemies of the government and abuse against the sovereigns at war with the republic. It was under the canopy of heaven and in the presence of the supreme being, to use the then fashionable expression, that those sermons were preached before the multitude, which never failed to be very numerous, if the weather happened to be fine. I was very anxious to be on the other side of the Alps that I might know what the general-in-chief thought of my conduct. At the passage of Montsenis, I met an aide-de-camp of General Augereau, called de Verina, who was returning dismayed with the harsh reception he had met with from General Bonaparte who acquainted me with his misfortune. He had been sent to Italy by his general a few days after the 18th of Fructidor to claim from the paymaster of the army 600,000 francs, which were not owing to him and which he thought no one would dare to refuse him. The same officer was also the bearer of copies of Clark's secret correspondence with Carnot from the time of his entrance into Italy. The generals of the army to whom Ogaro sent copies of those letters were very much abused in them by the military diplomatist, and the general-in-chief was even attacked in his private character. Enraged against Clark, they thought fit to deliver into the hands of their chief these abusive letters without dissembling their contempt for a man they had never seen in their ranks. General Bonaparte, having heard of the demand for money, made on the paymaster the army, ordered him not to pay it, and, having sent for the poor aide-de-camp, he gave him a severe reprimand and sent him back to Paris as quickly as he could. The young man was extremely grieved at his adventure and bestowed many imprecations on Ogaro for having exposed him by such a ridiculous message. This little accident gave me some insight into General Bonaparte's disposition and I hurried the more to rejoin him. I was entering the long avenue leading to the castle of Passeriano, when I perceived Clark, who stopped my carriage. The directory had deprived him of his diplomatic mission and dismissed him as a general on half pay. I am in the most wretched condition, he said to me, but you may still be of service to me. Do not speak of the directories being incensed against me and mention my dismissal as a natural consequence of the fall of Carnot. By that means, General Bonaparte will keep me with him. He knows the secret of what I wrote against the generals. He'll silence them. Clark was unfortunate. I had been long acquainted with him, so I gave him my word that I would serve him. The thing was not altogether very difficult. The general-in-chief had a liking for him. The directory forgot him and did not insist on his leaving the army. I had scarcely arrived at the castle when General Bonaparte sent for me into the garden and there continued questioning me during four hours. My correspondents had acquainted him with all the particulars of the event, but I was still obliged to describe the hesitations, fits of passions, and almost every gesture of the principal actors. His opinion had been long fixed respecting the different members of the directory and even the nature of the government himself. But, said he, with such rude forms, why so much weakness? Why then so much temerity when firmness would have been sufficient? There was cowardice in not daring to put Pichagru on his trial. His treason was obvious and the witnesses more than sufficient to convict him. At best, if the high court had acquitted him, he would nevertheless have been dishonored in the face of the army in all France. Force is good when one cannot do otherwise, but when one is free to choose, justice is better. Then, according to custom, he continued for a long while, walking about in silence. At last, he added, on taking leave of me, All things well considered, this revolution will prove a vigorous stroke to the nation. When he returned to the castle, he sent for Bateau, the secretary to Barat had a long conversation with him and sent him back in the course of the night. 
few days afterwards, Bernadotte returned from Paris. I soon perceived that he had represented events under a more favorable light for government than I had. But through all the particulars he mentioned, his numerous animadversions on the War Department and his conjectures on the renewal of hostilities, General Bonaparte had no difficulty in penetrating his ambition and his designs. The Directory had loaded him with praises. The Ministry of the War Department had been promised him, and when a short time after, the General-in-Chief learned the nomination of General Ogaro to the command of the Army of the Rhine, he felt that was so weak a companion and so ambitious a minister, it would be impossible for him to advance freely and to obtain glorious results. Peace was consequently resolved on in his mind. I am far from doubting that considerations of a more elevated nature, and especially the wish to give peace to France, then sinking under the burthen of her sacrifices, swayed his resolution, but most certainly the choice of those two men contributed greatly to fix it. During the long and occupied days that the diplomatic debates afforded him, the general-in-chief used to pass a part of his evenings with the learned Monge, whom he had summoned near his person. Among the varied and instructive conversations which delighted the general-in-chief, the plan of conquering Egypt, so often presented to the ministry in the reign of Louis XV and Louis XVI, was discussed. The general, who always went to the bottom of everything, wished to read all that had been written on the subject. Monge having held for some time the portfolio of the Marine Department, was enabled to procure him quickly all the most interesting papers. The measures that had been proposed appeared faulty to the general in chief, but the fertility of his mind made him discover the advantages he might derive from his position to lay down a plan easier of execution and better in its result. It is probable that the idea was at that very moment communicated to the directory, for soon after the first germs of its execution began secretly to develop themselves. Monsieur Pusegui, the chief of the treasury, was at that time secretary of the French legation at Genoa. This gentleman had several relations, merchants at Malta. He was called to the headquarters, and from thence he went to Malta. His mission was to sound the disposition of the government and the French knights, to get well acquainted with the spirit of the people, and to ascertain what were meant to be the means of subsistence or the obstacles to be expected. Finally, he was to do his utmost to send to the headquarters some of the Knights of Malta, whom Bonaparte might have known as the military school. This mission was executed with great secrecy and intelligence, and during Pussyge's absence, secret efforts in furtherance of this object advanced rapidly to lead curiosity astray. The general spoke of a journey he proposed to make after the peace was concluded. He said he intended to go to Germany and the north of Europe with his wife, Monge, Generals Berthier and Marmont. I was destined to accompany Eugène Beauharnais, who at that time was no more than 17 years of age. General Bonaparte diverted himself with setting up a plan of studies and observations of which we were to give an account at the different places where we were to meet. That plan was more reasonable, as General Bonaparte could scarcely live at rest in France. If peace lasted any time, he would not have been able to avoid the clashing of the different factions and would perhaps have been forced to take part in the measures they would have attempted with a view to triumph. The directory was afraid of him. His glory was annoying. His influence over the enemy could not fail to be immense. On the other hand, he was too young to have a place in the directory, and the idea of being the minister of Barra and La Riviere Le Pau was not to be born. All these reflections determined him to make peace, notwithstanding the contrary orders of the directory. Misunderstanding the satisfaction showed themselves in all the letters he addressed to the government. His unpublished correspondence contains three of those letters in which his ill humor is displayed with a degree of energy and pride that made the directory tremble and was the source of the hatred which in course of time brought on the 18th Brumaire. The directory did not wish to sacrifice Venice to Austria. General Bonaparte wanted to remain in Mantua and as his instructions did not prescribe absolutely that he should not have been at Venice. He took upon himself to sign on the 4th Vendemire, 25th of September, the Treaty of Passeriano. Well convinced that government would not dare to express discontent openly and that France, rejoiced at peace, would overrule her with applause, the rumors of the general's enemies. According to our calculations, the courier of the directory 
was to arrive at Passeriano on the very day fixed for the signature. Bonaparte was reckoning with me the distance the courier had to go and the hour he might arrive, and he candidly acknowledged the perplexity he would be in if he received from government an order not to go any farther. Recollecting afterwards with disgust the slow march of Moreau in Germany a few months before, while he was at Loben, and the appointment of Ogerode to the command of the Rhine army, instead of to say, whom he had recommended in the most pressing manner, he added, in a tone of much ill humor, I see very well that they are preparing defeats for me. That man, meaning Ogero, is incapable of conceiving an extensive plan. He will get beaten or will not advance at all. All the Austrian forces will then fall upon me, and my beloved Italy will be the grave of the French army. He then questioned me as to the disposition of that part of France through which I had traveled, and I assured him that peace would be received with enthusiasm, that the people would bestow blessings on him, and that public happiness would be his work. At last, on the 27th of Vendemir, the ministers of Austria were called to Passeriano, and the secretaries of the two legations made copies of the treaty. That business lasted the whole day. The general was delightfully merry. No more discussions. He remained a part of the day in his saloon and would not even have the candles lighted when it grew dark. We sat talking and telling one another ghost stories like a family living in an old castle. At last, at about 10 o'clock at night, he was told that all was ready. He ran to his closet, cheerfully signed the document, and at midnight, General Bertier, the bearer of the treater, treaty, was on the road to Paris. Twelve hours afterwards, the courier of the directory arrived. The orders were positive, and if they had come to hand the day before, the treaty would not have been signed. The next day, the general in chief wrote to the director expressing his wish to leave Italy and to come to France to enjoy a little repose but it was absolutely necessary first to organize a Cisalpine Republic to take prudential measures against the Pope and the King of Naples, who showed the most hostile intentions. A squadron of troops had been sent to Corfu, Zante, and Cephalonia to take possession of these Venetian lands, which had been given to France by the Treaty of Campo Formio, and the general did not think fit to leave Italy before he received accounts of their organizations. In the meanwhile, Monsieur Pusigny was beginning to give the required information respecting the disposition of the public mind at Malta. He had succeeded in sending to the military Monsieur N., his former schoolfellow at the military school, and who had been for several years a knight in the island. From his report and from the letters of Monsieur Pusigny, it appears that the knights of the French tongue, receiving neither money nor reward from their relations and reduced to the most miserable shifts to live, would not stand much upon their fidelity to the order, and that they would have no objection to leave the island, provided they got leave to return to France. That the Grand Master Hompesh, a man devoid of strength of mind, would probably make no use of the means of defense he possessed in his military possession, and the land and sea forces he had at his disposal. The persons who surrounded him had an influence over him so much the more pernicious on account of the desire of both the English and the Russians to gain possession of that island. The Russian consul was a bold and active man who frightened the government by his threats and spread disorder and terror in the minds of everyone. It was therefore of great consequence to General Bonaparte to take a resolution and show himself before the island. With an imposing force, it might decide the Grand Master in favor of France. He resolved at last to leave Italy. He addressed a proclamation to the army and left it under the command of General Kilmaine. Bonaparte crossed Switzerland and went to Rastatt. His traveling companions were General Marmont, Duroc, myself, his secretary, Burienne, and Ivan, his physician. The only place at which he stopped was Geneva, where the directory was already beginning by underhand maneuvers to augment the number of its adherents, who were one day to effect the union of that republic with France. Carnot had sought refuge in that city, and General Bonaparte privately sent him advice to leave it as soon as possible, so as to prevent a persecution he was not able to prevent. Monsieur Necker was then living on his estate at Cope, near Geneva. He still looked upon himself as a great man and flattered himself that the conqueror of Italy would pay him a visit. I do not know 
was at that time General Bonaparte's opinion of the financial talents of the late minister of Louis XVI, but I'm sure he had but little esteem for his personal character and had positively declared his disappropriation of the sovereign's choice of minister for France. We had a great desire to go with him and see the seat that Voltaire had celebrated in the latter part of his life, but the general-in-chief had also a grudge against Voltaire. He therefore thought fit not to make either of the two pilgrimages. We crossed Switzerland without stopping anywhere. However, his carriage, having broken down a league from Marat, we traveled that part of the way on foot. Though it was no more than seven o'clock in the morning, the road was covered with people, and especially women who had passed the night there to get a peep at the conqueror of Italy. When we arrived near the bone house, where lie deposited the remains of the Burgundian soldiers killed in the famous battle at Mora. We found a general airlock of the celebrated family of that name who was waiting for the general in chief in the expectation that he would stop to see the monument. General Bonaparte, not being in military uniform, the stranger, without knowing him, gave him all the particulars he could wish respecting the victory of the Swiss. After he had exclaimed the military position, he only said, Charles the Bold must have been a great madman. This reflection, uttered in a firm tone, appraised Mr. Derlock that he was in the presence of the hero he had so much wished to see. A respectful bow and a compliment expressed with emotion were the only homage he was enabled to pay him, for the general proceeded on his journey. Two days afterwards, we passed through Offenbach the headquarters of Ogaro, the general chief of the Rhine army. General Bonaparte stopped before his door and sending him word that he was there, but in too great a hurry to get out of his carriage, he added that he wished to see him for one moment. The lieutenant of the general in chief had, however, already begun to forget him, and his only answer was that he was dressing. This unpoliteness was but ill repaired the next day when he sent his aide de camp Augereau's hatred of General Bonaparte augmented in proportion with his wrongs and only ended with his life. The Treaty of Campo Formio, it was agreed that a Congress should assemble at Rastatt to treat of peace between the Empire and the French Republic. The choice of the place recalled to the memory the celebrated period of 1707 when the castle of Rastatt united on its walls the Duke of Villar and the Prince Eugène of Savoy. This time the emperor did not think fit to be represented by one of his warriors. They had all of them been beaten by the French. Count Metternich represented the Roman Emperor, and Count Latterbach, the King of Bohemian and Hungary. Count Cobencel came there with the other negotiators who had signed the Treaty of Campo Formio. On the side of France, there was Monsieur Trailhard, late member of the convention, who not only had voted for the death of the king, but who had even boasted at the time that it was he who had persuaded the Duke of Orléans to give the same vote. He was a very learned lawyer and a man of rigid character. The criminal code was composed by him. He was far from being eloquent and had not even an easy style of elocution. He was accompanied by Monsieur Bonnier d'Arco, a harsh man of a violent and frequently untractable humor. These two plenipotentiaries were all but pleasing to the diplomatists covered with stars and whose ancient names were preceded by their high-sounding titles. The contrast was singular, for the two ambassadors of the Republic never wore any but round hats, and their shoes were fastened with strings. But the other nations were obliged to submit to the French Republic, and the railleries to which these two gentlemen were exposed were never expressed in their presence. The general-in-chief had no desire to remain at Rastatt. The obscure discussions of the negotiation and the artful finesse of the German chancery would have been a sad recompense for the fatigue he'd suffered in the army and a still sadder one for his victories. Nothing, therefore, took 
place but mere form. Only one remarkable circumstance happened during his short stay. The King of Sweden, in his quality of Grand Duke of Pomerania, had sent to the Congress or Rastatt Count Fersen, formerly celebrated at the Court of France and who had acted so conspicuous a part in the famous journey to Varennes. The hatred of his sovereign for France was a well-known fact, and the Count could not be agreeable. He happened to express the fatal wish of being presented to the general. When he was in his presence, the latter said to him, How could you expect, sir, you could be able to serve the interests of Sweden, you who are only known by your affection for a government justly prescribed in France and by your useless exertions for its reestablishment? Monsieur de Fersen replied by a few words which we did not hear. General Berthier, who was present, wishing to relieve him, recalled to his memory that they had fought together in America. By that means, the ambassador retired a little less perplexed, and the next day he left Rostat, whither he did not return until some time after.